Hey, welcome everybody. My name is Peter Loge. I'm the director of the Project on Ethics and Political Communication here at the School of Media and Public Affairs at the George Washington University. Now, before we start, a reminder that we are recording today's event. The only people who will be on screen are those who are not on mute. So stay on mute. We've been at Zoom for a year and a half now, people. You know what to do. I will post a link to the, to the recording online uh, in a day or two, tech permitting. We'll also email around the link to to everybody who registered for the event. Uh, as I said, my name is Peter Loge. I direct the project on ethics and political communication. We launched the project in the spring of 2019 to promote the study, teaching, and practice of political communication ethics. I really hate the phrase now more than ever, but uh, you know there does seem to be some urgency to this moment. The project does this through, through a couple of different ways. Uh, we, we write for outlets like Campaigns and Elections, The Hill, and other publications. We give talks around the country, both virtually and, and in person. The next one will be on Thursday, uh, Thursday evening at Western Michigan University, their, their Center for the Study of, I want to make sure I get this right, the Center for the Study of Ethics and Society. Uh, we're, we work on case studies with the University of Texas, Austin, our classroom ready case studies on ethical challenges political communicators may face, very ripped from the headlines kinds of stuff promoting a book called Political Communication Ethics, Theory and Practice. It's a textbook. It's the first one of its kind to bring together chapters from academics writing about speech writing, race, Isocrates, Machiavelli, and the rest. And half the chapters are from practitioners, uh, people who do, do politics day to day, talking about how it really looks on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we, I teach a class here in the School of Meaning Public Affairs on ethics and political communication. It's on the books. I believe it might be the only undergraduate course in the country called Political Communication Ethics. It lives in the University Bulletin, which I think is pretty cool. And if we have a five question series where we ask political practitioners and others the same five questions about ethics and political communication. And of course, we host conversations like this. Hosted uh, a lot of these talks, both live and, and on Zoom with speech writers. Uh, we've talked about race with leading rhetorical scholars. One of my favorite conversations was, um, one of my favorite conversations was Sorry, I want to admit everybody to uh, the waiting room here. One of my favorite conversations was between a candidate and a, um, with a candidate and a philosopher talking about the ethics of, of what they had of, um, there we go. Um, talking about the ethics of, of running for office and how all of that looks. So a bit of a technical glitch. It's a bit weird and a little disturbing more than a year into this stuff. All right, so that's the project, that's where we are. Uh, as I said, um, we're recording this event, glitches and all, with posting online, so keep yourself on mute. A number of people who registered for the event asked questions um, as they registered, we'll try to get to those. If you have other thoughts, I encourage you to put them in the chat, we'll try to get to those as well. As you put questions and comments in the chat, bear in mind, this is a conversation about how to make ethics and political rhetoric better. So please model good behavior, let's not try to keep dragging it down even further. And uh, I think that's it, I think that's it. So I am really pleased and thrilled to have people I've gotten to know as, as friends and colleagues over the years join the conversation today. I'm gonna to introduce them in alphabetical order by last name, because you gotta pick a way and that seems like a reasonable way as any to do it. The first is Karen Finney, who many of you know, whose face and background probably looks familiar from viewers of CNN. Uh, Karen is a CNN analyst, former host of her own show on MSNBC, she was a senior advisor to the gubernatorial campaign for Stacey Abrams in 2018, a topic to which we'll return. She's the, uh, the Democratic National Committee's first African-American spokeswoman. She was a senior advisor and senior spokes spokesperson for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016. She's one of the most sought after and respected Democratic strategists around. We're very lucky to have Karen with us. We're also lucky that Karen was a Turker Fellow here in the School of Media and Public Affairs at GW. Uh, as well as she was also a fellow at the Institute of Politics at Harvard. So welcome, Karen. Thank you. Next, alphabetically, by last name, is Samantha Millar, who's a student here in the School of Media and Public Affairs. She's the director and co-editor of Mediafile, which is a project that, that SNTA does. I encourage everyone to check out. She's co-president of Voices for Choices and a former intern at the Justice Policy Institute, which is one of the nation's leading criminal justice reform organizations. Uh, Samantha has been a student in a couple of my classes and is currently in a class I teach on advocacy, which is kind of the theory and practice of lobbying. And we talked about ethics, after which she sent me a very long and heartfelt email about the challenges um, 
you know, the gap between what we talk about, what ought to happen, and then how things go at work. So I'm looking forward to diving into that and getting her take on this. And the proximate cause for our conversation is friend and colleague, Ethan Porter. Ethan is an assistant professor here in the School of Media and Public Affairs. His writing has appeared in leading academic journals. We've got, he's got a lot more writing in leading academic journals coming out, one of which is the, the cause for this, or the number of his, his co-authors on political rhetoric and democratic trust. He's written for the Washington Post, for the New York Times. He regularly appears in national and international media. He's the author of False Alarm, The Truth About Political Mistruths Mis -truths in the Trump Era. Um, he's been, been a leading researcher on, vocal advocate for the fact that fact-checking actually works and people can learn if you tell them what's actually going on. Uh, he's most recently the author of The Consumer Citizen, which is a really interesting and thoughtful look at, at political behavior. It relies on, on political science and experimentation, but he also writes incredibly well. So it's actually a good read as well as a thoughtful and academically rigorous read. Um, and Ethan's just a, a terrific guy. So we're really lucky to have him with us. So with all of that, what I'm going to do is start by asking um, Professor Porter, you know, your research is the reason we're here. Tell us, and you and your colleagues, many of whom are also here with us, um, some of the most distinguished political scientists around are, are part of this research. Uh, what did you all do and what did you all find? Well, Peter, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, Samantha, Karen, it's so great to be here. Uh, Karen, I've admired you from afar on TV. And Samantha, I've admired you also from afar on Zoom as a student of mine. Um, so it's, it's, really, it's really great to, to join you. And of course, Peter, thank you so much for the very kind words of introduction. Um, so a basic finding in political science since forever has been that political leaders have effects on the beliefs of their followers. Um, this has been true for, for this is research has been showing this for decades, um, often about um, sort of comparatively small matters. Um, comparatively small meaning uh, political leaders can influence their, their, their followers' perceptions of the economy. Um, political leaders can influence their followers' perceptions of um, any number of indicators of uh, performance or uh, you know, sort of the, the, the state of affairs in the world. Um, now, compared to the particular topics um, we examine in this paper, those questions are small. Um, in, in this paper, we examined whether or not political leaders can actually influence their followers' support for democracy. Um, we were inspired, you know, uh, obviously by, by Donald Trump, who spent uh, a fair bit of 2016 and a fair bit of 2020, as everyone on this call knows, attacking democracy, right? issuing uh, claims, making statements um, that, that to any observer would amount to attacks on the integrity of the American electoral system. Um, so suddenly as a, as a, as a researcher, um, I said, as did many other people, um, hey, is, is Trump's rhetoric um, affecting people's views toward democracy? Um, so this isn't, you know, can a president make his followers think the economy is a little better than it actually is? This is something more fundamental. Um, so working with Brendan Nyhan, Tom Wood, Katie Clayton, and uh, Tim Davis, uh, and Tim Ryan, two Tims, um, we spent a fair bit of the 2020, the tail end of the 2020 election, um, bringing people into a survey environment, and over time, over a period of weeks, randomly exposing them to uh, some of the most norm-violating tweets of Donald Trump. Um, and through this randomization process, we actually get to isolate the effects of Trump's tweets on people's subsequent attitudes and behaviors. So we're not just looking at a correlation between, oh yeah, I saw Trump's tweets and I believe so-and-so. We're actually saying, you know, Trump's tweets are causing or perhaps not causing um, certain changes in uh, the, the attitudes and behaviors of his followers. Um, so we conducted the study for about a month. Um, and, you know, again, the tail end of the election. We're, we're showing people real Trump tweets, real Trump tweets in which he attacked the election, as, as you all know he did. He did so often, he did so many times. We don't, I mean, depressingly enough, we had a lot to choose from. Um, and, and there's sort of a good news, bad news uh, element to what we found. Um, the good news is overall Trump's tweets um, did not cause Americans to lose faith in democracy or you know, increase their willingness to endorse political violence. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is that once we broke down our findings, um, it became clear that um, 
a president's ability to influence his supporters' views um, isn't limited to perceptions of the economy. It extends to basic support for democracy. Um, Trump's rhetoric, you know, his, his anti-democratic rhetoric, so to speak, um, did have negative, uh, so, you know, statistically significant effects on support for democracy among his supporters, uh, measured in a variety of different ways. Um, these effects proved pretty robust. Um, and ultimately, I think we're a little depressing, um, to, be, to be frank, because we all went into this hoping um, that we wouldn't find what we found. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with one, one um, additional wrinkle to these findings that I think is also worth um, just putting on the table. Um, we did not observe Trump's rhetoric uh, causing an increased support for political violence, even among his supporters. Um, now, again, that, that doesn't mean the case is closed on Trump's uh, capacity to foment violence. Um, I want to be very clear about that. But, you know, that sort of worst case scenario where, yep, Trump is responsible for increasing support for political violence, we did not find evidence of. Um, but he's certainly responsible, his rhetoric is responsible, or at the very least was responsible at the tail end of the election for reducing confidence in democracy. I think, I think folks can see why Ethan's students voted him the professor of the year in the School of Media and Public Affairs um, a couple of years ago, which is a very cool honor. So Karen, you've spent a career helping create political rhetoric for political leaders and would-be political readers. Are you surprised by what, what Ethan's found? What do you think? I'm not surprised. Um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's great to be here with everybody. Um, I'm not surprised, and particularly for a couple of reasons. Number one, there was a Pew study in 2019 that showed one in five Americans follow Trump on Twitter, roughly. And as I recall, in, by 2020, before he, his account got suspended, his reach, I believe, was bigger than the circulation of like the New York Times, the Washington Post. So just think about what social media enabled in terms of his ability to reach people, to circumvent traditional media, to have a direct conversation with people. And as a political communicator, usually that's a good thing. That's part of how Bernie Sanders, for example, really grew because being able to have that very personal relationship with your followers is really important, um, no matter who you are when it comes to social media. He also, remember, would always say, trust me, don't trust them. You can't trust them. You can trust me. And so he really built, it was almost like, it's almost been like a cult-like status, if you will. We haven't seen that phenomenon among many other political leaders, to be perfectly honest. Um, and most don't use that type of channel in the way that Trump did. However, part of Trump's power, and we were just talking about this a little bit before we came on, is that, and we saw this in 2016, um, you know, he understood how to tap into grievance politics and the racial animus and the, the the mood in the country. You know, I always say like one of the things in 2016 we didn't understand when people were talking about economic anxiety. For a long time, we thought, oh, let's talk about our plan to raise the minimum wage and our this and our that. That's not what they meant. They meant, I'm worried my kids for white voters, I'm worried my kids won't be able to do as well as me because those people are taking their jobs, right? And so, and that's what Trump really understood. There's been a lot of research about that. And so part of what I think Ethan has tapped into here is a reality that we have to acknowledge this is part of who we are as a country, these divisions. And someone like Trump was able to really tap into it and take hold of it in ways that got people to trust him or right-wing media over what they could see and hear with their own eyes. That last thing I'll say on this, I think the one place where we started to see a fracture on this in 2020, and there were many along the way, but the biggest was COVID. Even though many of us believe, and 
polls have shown, he politicized mask wearing and to lengths that you know put people's health at risk. But when people were seeing in their own lives that what he was saying is not true, that was really the only way. That was the place where you started to see people start to break. Otherwise, they were willing to believe him. And again, because they felt like he understood their angst and their anxiety and their fear of the way the world was changing. So all, all of that makes sense. And I want to get back to, to the role of consultants in that and what, what you and I as an industry can do. But before we do that, I want, I want to ask Samantha, you're, you know, it's one thing for your professors and senior commentators to say all of this. It's quite another to be a college senior studying political communication, wanting to change the world and about to enter this madness. Uh, what, what's your take on all of this? Yeah, thank you so much for having for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and I'm so excited to hear about Professor Porter's research and to hear from Karen Finney over Zoom. That's just very exciting. Um, I think part of the issue is that for so many people and me included before I was really immersed in this and have spent four years studying it, I think the power and the danger that lies in political communication and political rhetoric is very abstract. Um, it took me four years to tr truly grasp how insidious it is and how far deep it goes and how powerful political rhetoric can be, especially in the digital age on social media. I think it's hard for people to grasp that the app that also gives them cat videos is where all the danger lies. I think it's really easy for people to kind of dismiss Trump tweets, even ones that are really violating democratic norms as just a tweet or just a crazy article that your aunt clicked on. Um, I think it's I think that's how most people kind of process these things and it's hard to register those as a threat. I don't really expect people to register it as a threat without having been immersed in it as, as we are. Um, so I guess part of the concern that I have is how do we create urgency around this issue? How does misinformation kind of make it to the top of the agenda when it's such an abstract concept? Um, how do you create compelling media and news stories around something that you can't take pictures of? That's a, a very complex issue. So I think that's what I've been kind of concerned about recently regarding this issue. You know, you raise, you raise a really good point. This is also very timely. Um, I, you know, this conversation probably could not be the better position on the calendar. Today's the last day of voting in Virginia and New Jersey and elsewhere. The Virginia race is very contentious. I've already booked a TV hit on it tomorrow morning. I'm looking forward to your insights that I can then use to talk to other people with. Um, and it's also on the heels of uh, some research that released over the weekend. <clears throat> conducted by um, a, a nonpartisan organization that found, among other things, that 68% of Republicans believe that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump, that 82% of those who, whose most uh, trusted news source is Fox News says the 2020 election was stolen, and 97% of those whose, whose most trusted news source is our far right outlets believe that the 2020 election was stolen. I mean, this and this was headline grabbing, right? I mean, I, it, it made a bunch of media outlets, at least the ones that that, that I see. Um, Ethan, Karen, what do you are you surprised by these new findings? Um, I'll, I'll jump in really quick. Um, so I, I would say I am both surprised and not surprised. I think one thing that comes immediately to mind is this debate we've had in the public opinion community for a while about expressive versus sincere or non-expressive responding. Um, so when I see numbers like that, I say, okay, how many of those people truly, sincerely, fully believe that the election was stolen? And I think the answer is probably not all. Um, but here's the thing, you don't actually have to believe that all of those people believe sincerely that the election was stolen to still be concerned about the number of people who do sincerely believe it. Uh, these numbers are really large. Um, and to me, they indicate there's a broader crisis of faith in, Demo in, in sort of lowercase d democratic um, uh, sort of functioning that Trump is responsible for. Um, I think that's also what's clear from this, this particular piece of research that, that we, we've talked about. Like Trump bears responsibility. We can, we can, we can talk about other sociopolitical factors, but a lot of this, I think, is at the feet of Trump himself. Um, which is both daunting, um, but perhaps might also um, make the problem seem a little more localized. So I'm going to take that into a couple of directions. 
Number one, I think part of it is, I don't know that it's that people have, it's that they have less faith in small D democracy, or is it they have more faith in and want to believe their own self bias and what Trump is playing into about, you know, these people are taking our jobs and we need to build a wall and we need, and you know, all of that race baiting um, type of rhetoric because it, because it's a confirmation bias, right? That it's, um, and we've, and this is part of the ugly story of this country, right? I mean, um, part of the way going way back to reconstruction, poor white people were told, no, no, you're better than the black people, even though you're poor, right? That was the, what the rich white landowners said. And as we know, Martin Luther King was trying to say, actually, if you're poor, you're poor. And where we should all be, so I, I, that's as a political communications person, I'm curious to know which is it. But I want to go back to something that Samantha said that's so important because, as a as someone who does this for a living, you know, it did used to be different. There did used to be some norms and lines around what you could say, what you people's children were generally off limits, right? Unless that they were a certain age and participating in a campaign. Certain topics were off limits. Imagine if America knew about John F. Kennedy's affairs, <laughs> would be a very different way we talked about him, right? I was thinking back even to, I worked in the 92 campaign. You know, in 92, we did the chicken George thing where somebody dressed up in a chicken suit was at every, you know, was at Bush events to call him chicken George because he wouldn't debate Bill Clinton. That is really mild <laughs> to base, you know, if you compare that to what's going on now. And over time, we've seen a real erosion. We've also seen misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation weaponized in ways, again, in 2020, we saw it in 2016, but again, in 2020, in ways unprecedented. And it is a huge problem because what shifted is it's not just the candidate being targeted, but now voters are being targeted. And Ethan, I think this is a lot of what your research talks about, those messages that voters are targeted with on all different platforms. And I'll share with you, there was an incident yesterday, you know, one of the memes or one of the misinformation campaigns about Vice President Harris was that she got to where she was, well, I'll say it nicely, on her back. And we were fighting that really ugly stuff, Joe and the Ho, all over. We've lost your audio, Karen. Can you hear me now? There yeah, we're good, there yeah, we're good. So yesterday there was an event in New York at the National Action Network there were people outside protesting with signs that had that message. That's not an organic event. That is an event where they, somebody took a political message, targeted a group of voters, a group of people, mobilized them to show up at an event. She wasn't at the event, at the event, an event to protest her. So I say that to say both the nature of the rhetoric the, the meanness, the, the, the topics have completely shifted because the, and the tactics. And there was a time when attacking democracy, for example, would have been unheard of. Um, and we are now in a whole new universe. And as a political communicator and as someone who's about to go do this work, it is really, I hate to say it, the Wild West because you know, new ways to do this are being invented as we speak using technology to undermine the faith and confidence. I think it's going to be one of the biggest problems that we'll have in 2022, quite frankly. Um, and it'll be in, you'll, will be interesting to see how much we learn after today was going on under the surface in New Jersey and Virginia. 
you know, you, you bring up some really good points of, about history and 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 pointing out in that comment and, and earlier that, that American politics has always been kind of nasty and awful. Um, during the out Adams Jefferson election of 1780, I believe, Timothy Dwight, who was the president of, of Yale University at the time, and he supported um, Adams said, if Thomas Jefferson were elected president, our wives and daughters would be subject to legal prostitution. So yeah, no, it's been <laughs> the the 1800s were with Twitter would have been just just off the hook, but but there is another piece of, of political history that I, I think is worth bringing up. Um, this isn't the first time people have claimed claimed fraud after an election, right? Um, in 1960, one could make a very strong case that that John Kennedy lost that election and that Nixon was elected. Um, Nixon obviously conceded so as for the betterment of the country, as a, a Republican consultant Ed Brokover points out in a, a chapter he wrote in a political communication ethics book. In 2000, we had, um, you know, hanging chads in Florida. One could make a case that that election was was stolen. Uh, but again, the vice president, Vice President Gore said, no, 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 after a long heated battle, 20, uh, 2004, there were questions about voting machines in, in Ohio. Then Senator Boxer wanted to delay the electoral certification, electoral count in Ohio on the floor because of questions, misplaced questions about voting machines in Ohio. And, and Karen, you were involved in Stacey Abrams' 2018 race in Georgia. Isn't 2020 more of the same? Is it different? And if so, how? Uh, yes and no <laughs> is the quick answer. And here's why. Um, actually, in 2000, after 2004, Don Brazil, who many folks may know, who, uh, who was a DNC member, actually, um, there was an, we did an investigation and there was seen to be problems with the, with the machines and there were a number of reforms that were passed after 2004. What is happening now, though, is that this landscape, so 2016 obviously hangs out there as the one we'll really never know what happened in terms of, we know that the Russians did intervene. We don't know what effect that had in the outcome of the election. Um, and I'll tell you, it's interesting very quickly on election night, uh, there was a conversation in 2004 on election night, there was a conversation about, as you may recall, we held to the next morning because we were trying to see, I was working with the, on the Edwards side of Kerry Edwards, trying to investigate how real is this? Is this gonna be worth plunging into another crisis like we saw in 2000? Election night, here we are again, 2016. And obviously in 2008 and 2012, the Obama team was very clear that they needed to win by an overwhelming number so that you could not. And that really is part of the strategy that you build in now. We had a similar thing on the eve of 2016 we realized, you know what, we just weren't, we didn't know that we could get there. And that's part of why Hillary ended up conceding. 2018, we went into election. Here's the challenge in 2018. And this is the new part of the strategy. We were running against the secretary of state who was running for governor. So the person we were running against controlled the election. And so like, there were a number of very nefarious things that he did. Um, for example, going into the weekend before, we were limited in what information we could get, even though he could get it because technically he was still the Secretary of State. So there were a lot of shenanigans going on and there were things that happened where, for example, in Fulton County, the largest county with African-American voters, there was a warehouse full of brand new machines that he refused to put in play while machines were breaking at like Morehouse College, which was one of the biggest voting locations. So yes, but we went into that night prepared that we might have real shenanigans, real trouble. And we started early in the day on election day, planning out strategies, path A, path B, path C. And one of the things that we did is we had a team of lawyers, a fresh team, ready to go the next morning at 8 a.m. to be in every polling, every location to watch the count because we didn't have access to the information that we needed. So I think what I'm, what I'm suggesting is part of what has also changed 
from the Democratic side. And it's ironic because it's the Republicans who are claiming fraud when what we're also seeing are increasing efforts to make it harder for people to vote and efforts that are targeting black and brown voters, young voters, seniors, disabled Americans tend to be impacted. So it's hard to tease that out. Um, what I would say in 2020, ironically, all of Trump's, um, and then I'll shut up, you know, talking about how it's going to be fraud and all this, they hurt their own, they, did, they actually harm their own turnout. And it's interesting because today in Virginia, one of the things we know is we've seen that the Youngkin campaign has been a little concerned because the big lie has persisted as Ethan's research shows over the year this year. So they're having to work overtime to turn their base out and convince their base that it's not a rigged election. So uh, Samantha, you've been, you've been listening patiently for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, you've been studying this diligently for four years. You're entering this field. Is it, is it depressing? Is it optimistic? What are you, how do you view this, this world you're going into? You need to take yourself off mute though. Good idea. I'll do that first. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this ever since a lecture you gave in our class recently about the importance of ethics in political communication and in political rhetoric, keeping those ethics that you have um, written down somewhere and sticking to those throughout your entire career. And I remember being so shocked, even though that's that's a pretty sensical concept there, uh, because I, out of all the career advice offered, and GW thankfully offers a lot of it, um, and just from people that I've talked to, people I've you know networked with, trying to do all that, there's not often that piece of advice in there. I think the most advice and career advice that's given is often very urgent, which makes sense because I think most people my age, our futures are uncertain. We're concerned about what it's going to look like when we're going out to get jobs. Um, we're concerned about what the, the planet is going to be like in our futures. So there's a sense of urgency around securing a job and kind of taking whatever comes to you first. Um, and I think that kind of undermines the desire to stick strictly to personal ethics, especially at the beginning of your career. Um, so just in thinking about all of that, when I went into my internship this past summer with a nonprofit that works on justice reform here in DC, I felt what I felt comfortable doing professionally change. And it wasn't really until that lecture that you gave that I really validated those feelings because it kind of contradicted almost the advice that I'd been being given about taking what comes first to you and taking every opportunity you can. So I guess my concerns going forward, especially for everyone my age who's looking to go into a political communication job, is how do you balance those two concerns, the urgency, the nervousness around the uncertainty in our futures, and then the desire to really stick strongly to our personal ethics right at the beginning of our career and, and throughout the rest of it. You know, that raises a really good question, right? We spent about half an hour talking about, you know, how awful it is on a scale of 10 to 11. How terrible is this? 12, right, ends up being the answer. Um, and I do think there are some distinctions between 2000, 2004, 20, 2016, 18, and 20. And part of it is that in all of those cases, at some point, the, the guy conceded, right? Vice President Gore said, we bet, wish the Bush presidency the best of luck. Really and I, I was part of the Obama administration. And, and right after the election, um, all the secretaries got on the phone with, with all of the politicals and said, you, you serve the American people. Um, so go home, lick your wounds for the weekend, come back to Monday morning, ready to work after 2018. Um, Stacey Abrams went out and registered a bunch of voters. So I feel like there, there, there may be a bit of a difference there. Karen, Ethan, how does Samantha, what advice do you give to Samantha and her colleagues about how to do better and how can we because as you know, Karen and I also do some political consulting. How do you and I and our people, our profession, do better at this? What specifically can we do to make it better? Ethan, what do you think? Sure. So, you know, first of all, I, I think there's a broader crisis of elite norms um, in this country. Uh, in, in one of that crisis manifests itself among our politics. Um, and I think we've got evidence for that in the continued power of Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been completely um, adversarial toward norms, long established norms. And it turns out that as my research shows that his hostility to norms has consequences. 
I think that aspiring political communicators and people who wish to take sort of operative roles need to hold fast to a set of normative beliefs or, or ethics, uh, just a, a set of standards that they're, they're not willing to, to sacrifice. And I think that's true on both sides. I, I worry about Trump sort of causing a, you know, it lowers the standards for everybody. Um, you know, so I, I think, you know, I'm a voter in Virginia. And this morning I see that, you know, Terry McAuliffe claimed that there was um, a, a Trump Youngkin rally last night. Like there was no Trump Youngkin rally last night. Um, and I think we need to be clear well, Politico says there wasn't. I'm just going with what Politico, Politico yeah, I, I, yeah, right. I don't, I, I'm just following what the facts were told to me. I, I just, I think we need to hold fast to sort of our beliefs. Um, otherwise, you know, you know, there's sort of this, this doom spiral that can occur and we all have a role to play in stopping it. Um, I, I teach persuasion and one of the, political persuasion, one of the key lessons from the persuasion literature is if, if you see a problem developing, it's your responsibility to step in and intervene and not just be a, 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 a sort of passive bystander. Um, and I think it you know, behooves Samantha and, and, her, and her colleagues to, you know, once they're out in the world, to say, no, no, I'm going to put a stop. I'm not going to permit this. Um, we're not going to do this. Um, and I think that, and I, yeah, I think that's what it takes. It takes everyone committing to help stop it in their own way. Karen, you do this for a living. What do you think? I agree 100%. I will say there was a tele rally last night. It was a Trump got on the phone. They did it via telephone because, again, they were worried about turnout. Anyway, um, 100% agree. But I think, I think we do it in two ways. Number one, and I do this as a commentator, and sometimes I've gotten in trouble, and sometimes it's okay. You know, early on, people were calling Trump's lies. You know, it was like mistruth, misspoke. And sometimes you have to be the person who says, no, that's just not true. It's actually just not true. Um, so part of it is being a truth teller. Um, because I agree with Ethan that we have to be careful that, I mean, that's why I talked about like, you know, some of these norms have changed technology and, and practices and tactics and technology has enabled weaponizing information in ways that we didn't do in the 90s or in the early aughts, right? So that's gonna continue to happen. And we, you've gotta be able to say, this is what's true, this is what's not true, this is what I'm willing to do, this is what I'm not willing to do. What's hard about it is, I'll say, go back to the Stacey Abrams example, the reason we spent election day preparing for three different scenarios is that we were, we knew we were fighting or up against someone who was not playing fair. And that's really hard. Same thing in 2016, same thing in 2020, Trump doesn't play fair, right? And so it's really hard when that's your opponent and you have, did I give the Biden campaign and our camp, Hillary's campaign, credit, we were not willing to, to play that. We weren't going to call people rapists and murderers. We weren't going to, there were certain things we were just not going to do. And Peter, as you know, I've said this to your class, as a political communicator, we have a, we have a real responsibility because we, what you say really matters, right? Um, and what your boss says really matters. So being someone who helps people think about well, what if we said it this way instead of this way or just flat out say you can say that but I'm not gonna represent I won't say that for you and being real clear where the lines are for you and never faltering that because once you do then that's that's when we get this the creep of the mission creep of you know we are in a place that is bad for America and bad for our democracy. You know, Ethan, that's something I took from your research is that there's sort of an erosion of democratic norms, right? I mean, as Karen, as you indicated at, at the beginning, um, you know, Trump didn't invent this. Uh, Dave Chappelle, Washington DC's own beleaguered Dave Chappelle said Donald Trump didn't invent the wave, he's just writing it. Um, Ethan, your research seems to indicate that there's an erosion of norms and an erosion of norms. 
do we start a virtuous cycle? You know, is there anything in your research or your colleagues' research you think to indicate that if Karen, you know, encourages her candidates to do better, if, if Samantha does does better, if we all do better, that things will get better? So the answer is maybe. Um, the most optimistic thing I can or I can say is that a lot of my research I focus on disabusing people of false claims of you know trying to counter misinformation. And, and by and large, fact checking works, right? So even though I know it has a it has a reputation for being a little square, a little boring, but it does its job, right? So in in, in a limited sense, um, if Don, you know, we, I showed this during the 2016 campaign. Trump supporters, when shown corrections of Trump's lies about his claims on crime, became more accurate after seeing the correction. They did not become any less supportive of Donald Trump, however, right? So if the goal is, hey, we just want an informed citizenry, then we should all do our part to, to better inform the citizenry. I also have some evidence that's not yet public, but I can just sort of share it with everyone on this call, that if people see a lot of corrections about Trump's false claims regarding the election. So if you see, if, if, you know, if you're told like, look, here's what Trump said, it's a lie on, on voter fraud. Here's what Trump said about, you know, ballots being cast illegally, it's a lie, you know, so on and so forth. Um, people's faith in, faith and confidence in elections can partially be restored. Um, this is an average effect. Um, so I, I think there is something to be said for simply providing people accurate information about some of these really pernicious lies he's disseminated. And, and you're probably saying to yourself, well, it's not going to, why should I do that? You know, it's not going to convince so-and-so, you know, my, my, my aunt or uncle is still going to love Donald Trump and, and maybe so, um, but it might make a small difference. And speaking of, of virtuous cycles, if we all do our part and provide accurate information, our sort of small or marginal contribution, I think can scale up. Can I also say, Peter, I think the second thing I would add to this though too is speaking, just thinking about political communication. I actually think we have to go back to having more rigorous standards and practices. And I think the social media platforms, you know, we're in this game right now. I know I keep coming back to them, but we're in this game where they say, okay, regulate us because they know most of the people on Capitol Hill, God love them, don't even know how to use half these technologies. <laughs> Let's be honest. So I do think we need to establish, reestablish some baseline norms when it comes to reporting, when it comes to, you know, media and information and how it is treated because there are no alternative facts, right? There is not, there can be, there are some things that are true or not true. And so, like I mentioned before, it used to be, it kind of makes me feel old to say it like that, way back when, you know, it used to be, like I said, if you wanted to put an ad on television, you had to present the research behind it that showed all your claims were true for a TV ad. We should reinstate that. We should, that should be the case, whether it's a Facebook ad you know, any kind of digital ad, you should have to show the facts behind what you're saying. We're in a place where people just get to put wild stuff out there and people will still say crazy stuff and figure out ways to get it in the ether. But one other thing we can do is to say there need to be standards and baseline practices and there need to be consequences that are real if those are violated. So Samantha, we're just about at time, but we're again sending you into this world. Are we getting it right? Feel better? Feel worse? What's what's your what's your final take on all of this? Or at least final take for the moment. Yeah, I think my final take for the moment. I really appreciate what Karen said about being the person who's not afraid to call it what it is, uh, which is that it's false. Um, it kind of sounds like that's an echoing theme throughout all of this, and I think that's. I think that could also be considered a positive um, from the culture on the internet currently that is all about sending out a bunch of information as well and, and releasing things and making things public and, and talking about it. So I think that's a value that definitely needs to be leaned into. Um, and I think the regulations are something that also need to be uh, talked about way more. I hope they make it closer to the top of the agenda 
as I was saying earlier, I think that's that's very hard to do, um, but I, I really hope that they get up there. This has been a terrific and interesting uh, set of conversation starters. Um, I'm leaving it optimistic, more optimistic than I was about 45 minutes ago. Uh, there can be a virtuous cycle. Fact checking can work. We can do better. Um, Karen is advising her candidates to do better, talking about doing better on television as she's commentating. Uh, Ethan and his colleagues are doing important work on it. And, and anybody who's met Samantha and her colleagues in the School of Media and Public Affairs, you know, they are committed to, to doing the right thing the right way, even if they don't always agree on what the right thing to do is. Um, and I also think it's, it's really heartening that so many of you came out today in the, in the middle of a, a Tuesday afternoon. I know the people on, on this are election officials around the country, journalists, political professionals, students, and professors. So uh, thank you all. Thank you for your continuing support of the Project on Ethics and Political Communication. All of you will get a link to this video in the next couple of days. Thank you, Samantha, Ethan, and Karen for all of your work, for your time today, and uh, onwards and upwards. Have a great afternoon, everybody.